Good afternoon, everybody. Let's put me back onto the big screen. Okay. Anyway, I'm Terence Watts. Uh, I've been in the world of therapy since 1989, and I've seen around uh, 40,000 client sessions and around 20,000 teaching hours. So it's fair to say that I know a fair bit about this business, uh, I've been, having been involved in it that long. Um, I, I've been full time all the way through. I'm not. I was never a part time therapist. Always from the very beginning uh, and within a few months I was seeing around 40 clients a week so I, I was pretty good at what I did. Today we're going to talk about the thing that I discovered in 2011 BWRT and it's the most right from the beginning the most amazing thing and what we're going to talk about is how it came into being the birth of it the science behind it the fact that evolution has quite a lot to do with it but is it brain which many of you have probably heard of, the lizard brain and how it works, where neurosis comes from, the fact that the subconscious is way out of date, which people often don't realise, and how BWRT makes the changes that it makes, because it makes them startlingly quickly. Um, one of the biggest problems with BWRT is that it just seems too good to be true, but I can promise you everything it's stated about it is absolutely the way it really is. It all started one very rainy Friday lunchtime in May, on May 2011, it's actually Friday the 13th, and I was skimming through a science magazine and I found an article about a science called Benjamin Libet, and Benjamin Libet was a field, a scientist in the field of human consciousness and a researcher in physiology at the University of California, and he was doing some interesting experiments. Uh, not, I could never find out exactly what I was searching for, but it was conducting an experiment on brain response times where the participants were wired up to an EEG while they watched a dot moving around a clock face. It's actually an oscilloscope. Um, not that, that makes much difference, of course. And they had to tell him what number the dot was on. At the moment, they become, became aware of the decision to raise their hand. And the experiment gave a very strange result in that it appeared to show that we don't have free will in the way that we usually think of it. Because it clearly showed that when the brain started responding, but there was a gap of over a third of a second between that moment and the moment when they reported being aware of that decision and a further fifth of a second before they actually reported it. So I can get my point out so I can draw your attention to things. So here is the moment when the brain started doing something and that was clear on his readings on the oscilloscope, a bit like an EEG. Um, this is where they became aware of what was already happening in the brain and this is where the action actually started. So that gap is interesting. It means from a psychology point of view, by the time you're doing something, by the time you notice you're doing something, you're already doing it. So by the time you notice anxiety, for instance, it's just too late to stop it. Now, Libet's experiments were decried at first. Uh, many people said it was total bunk, it couldn't possibly be right, it was faulty timing, it was heresy, we all know we've got free will and so on. I think it actually scared a lot of people, the notion that we may not have free will in the way that we think of it. <clears throat> but many controlled following studies confirmed the same thing. Some of them showed even longer times. The longest one I've heard of showed a, a, a wait time of 10 seconds. Uh, and I think that's a bit extreme. But nonetheless, it's been repeated over and again. So anyway, I was reading through this article when suddenly I had a kind of lightning bolt moment of realization of how I could use that gap in therapy. I immediately rushed into my study, which is the room you can see immediately here behind me. Immediately rushed into the study. I started typing loads and loads of notes and ideas for the next seven or eight hours or so. I couldn't get down onto um, text everything that was in my mind because it had sort of flew into my mind and some of it flew out again. Uh, I don't know where it came from. There are some spiritually minded people who have said it was a cosmic down download. Well, I wouldn't argue about that i don't know where it came from it was just as if i suddenly knew all this stuff and had known it for a long time and so i started typing a lot of what i typed that day actually is used in training so when i finally got the first version working i tried it on me first i try everything on me first then my wife try everything on judy second and then some students and we all survived so it seemed safe to try it with clients and it was 
just astonishingly remarkable from the start. It just, I couldn't believe the results I was getting. In fact, I kept checking and rechecking. And I thought it must be because the people knew me and wanted to please me, wanted to keep me happy and so on. So I tried it with a student, uh, with a, a client that I'd actually not met at any time before. Uh, a new client came in. He was not suitable for my normal modality, which was hypnoanalysis. And I told him about my experimental work. He wanted to know it was free. I said it wasn't, but we did it anyway. And it was commitment phobia. He tried to propose to his girlfriend many times, but always bailed out at the last minute. On one memorable occasion, he'd said to her, in his brain, he'd formed a love you very much, will you marry me? Or worse than that effect. And what came out was fancy a cup of tea, mate. Uh, so anyway, I did that with him. And the next day I got an email and he said, what you're doing is a miracle i proposed for her last night and she accepted and that was the first client where i realized i've got something special i didn't know the guy he would got no reason to please me he had every reason to tell me it didn't work in fact now that gap doesn't indicate that life was preordained as some people think and that's why some people have difficulty in believing the science behind bwrt it doesn't indicate that life is preordained at all there's nothing spiritual about it it's all to do with brain evolution. The earliest part of our brain is the brain stem and the cerebellum, often referred to as the lizard brain because, uh, sometimes reptilian complex, because it was the only brain the earliest land creatures had. It had to do absolutely everything necessary to sustain life, hunting, feeding, sleeping, and breeding, all the main systems. And it had to do with the support of the, the body and all sorts. Those first land-based creatures appeared about 400 million years ago. They're a type of lizard, technically known as tetrapods, if you're scientifically orientated, but hence the term lizard brain. But that same neural system had existed in even earlier creatures for at least another 150 million years uh, before that. Which I've got a screen shot here. Now this is called Dickinsonia believed to be the first creature on earth with a recognizable nervous system. It lived approximately 570 million years ago. Uh, I've read that it was 550 million years. I've also read it was 600 million years. In other words, the fossil record isn't clear. At first, scientists weren't sure if it was a plant or an animal, but it eventually was decided it was an animal with the first evidence of a rudimentary neural system. This early brain was a highly successful survival engine, generating not just the sleeping, feeding, hunting, and eating behaviors, but also instant motor action for fight or flight in the presence of recognized threat. And there was also a freeze response. And there are several different hypotheses about that, and I'll talk about the freeze response later. Now, evolution just doesn't dump anything that works perfectly, and this was the perfect survival engine, so evolution doesn't dump it. It tends to develop in, instead and so it's that part of the brain, more developed, that's still present in all sentient animals, including humans, with the same structure. And it's still the first responder to events around us. Now, this is a, a modern a human brainstem and cerebellum. 550 million years ago or so, 550 million years ago, the reptilian complex was the only brain the, fir the, brain the first sentient creatures had had to do everything necessary to stay alive. And this is the modern human version of it, also known as the lizard brain. Now, there's no logical or rational processes in this part of the brain, no sense of good or bad or right or wrong, anything else. That sort of assessment comes in a much later part of the brain, in the more modern part. This is the very early part of the brain. It's the cerebellum that does most of the work. And it's actually a simple pattern matching device, which recognizes or searches for and recognizes patterns of events in the environment around us and triggers an appropriate response or what appears to be an appropriate response. It will actually be a response you've created before. It stores billions of patterns and as yet nobody in the world has discovered exactly how it does that. It used to be thought until quite recently that the cerebellum was only concerned with movement coordination but later discoveries have shown it does far more than that and also that it contains close to 70 billion neurons, 80% of the brain's total. So the bit of you that is conscious and aware is controlled by 80 or 90% of it. You don't know what's going on at all. And it's fast, far faster than thought. 
because in that part of the brain there's no logical analysis or rationalization it's just an instinctive and immediate reaction to do what we've done before for the same stimulus after all if you're still here it led to survival and that's what this part of the brain is all about some people teach that the, the subconscious is designed to keep us safe. It's not strictly true. It, it, it does it, but that's not what it's about particularly. It's just about repeating previous action, which is why if you try to do something differently, you're much more likely to find yourself dropping back to a previous action because the, that part of the brain just wants to do what it's done before because that led to you being, to, to staying alive, to, to surviving. So it would try to have you doing exactly the same thing before. And you all know that thing where you think, right, I'm going to do this differently this time. And before you know where you are, you're doing exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. Very difficult to, to change and sustain even a small amount of change. People talk about the speed of thought, but instinctive responses from that reptilian complex are far faster than any creature could think. You know, if somebody lobs a ball towards you, you try to catch it without thinking about it. You don't think, oh, I better try and catch that. You're instinctively trying to catch it. If they throw it at you, you're instinctively trying to dodge it. If you're moving some stuff around on a shelf, in a cupboard, or on a mental piece or whatever, and one hand nudges something off the shelf, the other hand flies out to catch it, again, without you even thinking about it. And if you miss it, it's likely you'll jam a foot forward to try to break its fall if it's something that's breakable. <clears throat> these are things that are much faster than thought. You don't think about doing them. It's something that happens instinctively. And people say, well, it's just instinct. Indeed it is. But instinct comes from this enormously, enormously fast part of the brain. And our instincts and intuition, contrary to popular belief, are not always good. They're just based on what we've done before. So anyway, fast forward to around 300,000 years or so ago to the most complex descendants by far of those earlier creatures, Homo sapiens sapiens. That's us. It's a double sapiens. People often just call us Homo sapiens, but we're Homo sapiens sapiens. It means wisest of the wise people, maybe. We've got probably the most sophisticated body and mind system that ever existed. It has the most amazing ability to envisage fantastic inventions and the physical skills to make them a reality. It's capable of reaching the bed of the deepest oceans and yet also can create fantastic machines to remotely explore other worlds beyond Earth by landing something on Mars to check about Mars, having a look at it all. But there's a problem. Since the reptilian complex came into being, which is still the first responder and uh, assesses the world before any other part of the brain, there's going to be a great deal of added biology in the form of the paleomammalian and neomammalian complexes, the later one from only about two and a half million years ago or thereabouts. Uh, and I've got a screen illustration for that. So the red line here, that's the, sorry, let's do the blue one first. The blue one here, that's the reptilian complex. That's the hindbrain and cerebellum with its 80% of the 85 total billion, uh, billion neurons in the brain. This red one, this one here, that's the paleomalian complex. That came into being about 25 million years ago. So they'd already been about 470 odd million or maybe more millions of years developing just with this same reptilian complex, this same brainstem and cerebellum governing everything we do. The paleomalian complex enhanced the um, processes of the limbic system. It gave it more responses. It still was not a thinking agency at all. And it wasn't until about two and a half million years ago when this part of the brain, this bit that everybody thinks about, and this part particularly that I'm outlining here, that's the part we think with our executive centers. But anything that comes in, the, in from the world comes in here first. And then it's got to travel a huge, huge amount of time. So the reptilian complex does its thing, just as it always has, and generates a response to the environment, whatever it's noticed coming in, whatever pattern it's matched. But we don't know what response that is until the message has reached our frontal lobes after traveling through a massive network of new neural pathways, up to 50 meters of them. But the bioelectricity in the brain travels only slowly. It takes around one third of a second to complete the journey. And that's what creates the gap that Benjamin Libet discovered. So by the time we're aware of it, our body and brain is already responding. We can 
veto, sometimes veto a response via what's often referred to as free won't. That means we can sometimes stop ourselves doing something the brain has already started to do. Although, more correctly, we can stop a physical action, but we can't stop the thought behind it. So we can stop ourselves from making a pass at somebody we desire, but we can't stop desiring them very easily, if at all. Sometimes it's the other way around, though. Sometimes we've been invited to a wonderful social event, perhaps, with people we'd love to meet, but to the reptilian complex. Such a situation represents danger in one form or another, even if we don't know why. Then it'll fill us with waves of anxiety if we even think about attending so that we avoid it. It's all about survival. And if the reptilian complex perceives a threat because of something that happened one time, it'll seek to stop us doing whatever it is by making us frightened of it. Because fear is the engine of survival. And in case you're wondering at this point, oh yeah, here we go, we've got to start finding the cause. No, we don't. That's the great thing about BWRT. We don't have to find out what it was that caused the fear. We only have to work with what it does as a result. We don't need to find out what caused it. The reptilian complex is not just about anxiety or fear, though, because every invention, every journey, every book ever written, everything starts with a thought. And the thought is based on the patterns stored in its billions of neurons. The patterns are based on experience. And so if we've not experienced anything in some way, then we can't think about it or imagine it. And we actually can't choose our thoughts at all. You might think you can choose your thoughts, but you can't. You can choose what to think about. Now, an interesting example of that is if I say car, you cannot not think of a car. But you didn't choose which car to think about, even if you may feel you did. The car that just popped into your head because the reptilian complex has done that. It's matched the word car, which is a pattern, to an object which you know about. It's matched those two together. And so you've seen a car in your mind's eye. Now, it might be a car you own. It might be a car that you would like to own. Uh, it might be a car that you've seen somebody else. It might be a car that you've seen on television somewhere. But whatever it was, it just popped into your mind. The same thing if I say something a bit more nebulous, if I say French. Now, you might think of the language, you might think of a person, you might think of something made in France, you might think of a baguette, you might think of anything to do with French, but you didn't choose that. It just popped into your head. It was already there. And that's exactly what the problem is. Now, if any of you keep dogs, you'll also know that on occasions, when you see something that you can't work out what it is, you actually stop. And the reason I mentioned dogs is because everybody with a dog has at some point gone, what's that on the floor? It's rolled up leafy. You don't know that at the time. And you stare at it. And just for that moment, your brain stops. It's focused on that one thing. And we do that all the time. If I say, what's this? No, you know what that is. It's a pair of glasses. You can't mistake it. You compared it without knowing it with absolutely everything. The pattern that was tested against every pattern your cerebellum has got, every single pattern. It's not a country or a camera or a glass of water or a clock or whatever. It's a pair of glasses. But if I say, what's that? Now, if you've got one, you will recognize what it is. If you haven't, you can now feel your brain stopping while you try to work out what it is. Your brain has gone into a kind of a wait state while it's waiting for more information. <clears throat> If I give you more information, you'll get, oh, it's that moment. So if I turn it over and push that button, you'll see it's actually a USB stick, but it's got two different connectors. It's got a USB 3 on the other side, like that. So now you know what it is. It's not remarkable at all. But when you saw that, you may not have known what it is unless you've already got one. So maybe the reptilian complex is what always used to be called subconscious. Let's get the screenshot up of that. But subconscious is interesting. It was a term that wasn't coined, uh, coined by Freud, which many people say it was. It wasn't Freud at all. But a man called Pierre Genet in 1899 to describe why we sometimes do stuff that we prefer not to do. It comes from a time before we were allowed to vote, before aeroplanes flew, and long before radio was even thought of. It was very much of its time. But this is the 19th century, and it was of its time then. It was at a time when people liked mysteriousness. So when Genet coined a term to, a term to explain why sometimes we find ourselves doing stuff, we have no idea why. 
to the Victorians at that time, that was a wonderful description, subconscious. And it was rather like seance and trance. It was a fantastic thing. Had Pierre Janet had access to MRI scanners, he would probably have realized that modern brain scientists do, that the, the brain stem is doing a hell of a lot. They couldn't be aware of it then. At that point, they thought it was to do with movement. And in fact, at one point, <clears throat> it was discovered that the, it was thought that the cerebellum was the center of sexual activity. So nobody's really understood that part of the brain. It may be that we don't fully understand it now, but modern research has been done with modern materials, and so it's probably right. Um, the cerebellum connects to every single part of the brain, so it's true to say that in the psyche, everything is connected to everything else. And we, it's a fact that we can use with BWRT. Now, the problem about subconscious is there's no unified idea or definition of subconscious. And they, they can't ever be because it doesn't exist other than as an abstract concept. So it can't ever be observed. And that means if you were to ask 100 different psychologists to define it, you would almost certainly end up with 100 different answers. But the reptilian complex with its hind brain and cerebellum does exist. And we know exactly what it does even if nobody is absolutely certain how it does it. So everything we think and everything we do is based on that which we already know. And if you don't know it or haven't got a pattern that matches it, something strange happens. You stop, as I explained earlier. Now, with a trauma where there's a massive shock and a possible threat to life, the freeze response is common. That freeze response is where the brain doesn't know what to do. That's my hypothesis. It stops because it hasn't got a pattern. It can't match a pattern. It's waiting for more information. It doesn't know whether to fight or run, for instance. So it waits to see what happens next. And if it's somebody with a knife and all the time that person with a knife stands there, you might stand there frozen. If the person moves towards you, that's the extra information. You might turn and run. If the person backs off a bit, that's the extra information you might try and hit them. So when you get the freeze response, the brain is waiting for further information. So the way the reptilian complex responds to an event and the psychological reaction we experience, that fires up before we can do anything about it. And that's where BWRT comes in. So taking social phobia as an example, we don't have to discover why the client reacts in the way they do to social situations. We can just change it to how they would prefer to act. As daft as it sounds, that's exactly what we can do. So when the reptilian complex encounters a shock and doesn't have a suitable response, it freezes momentarily. We call it a wait state until it receives more information. And that's where BWRT comes in. BWRT creates an artificial wait state, an artificial freeze on whatever the client wants to work on, whatever it is, whether it's overeating, a claustrophobia, uh, agoraphobia, social, social phobia, um, oh, depression, OCD, literally anything you can think of. We create an artificial weight state on whatever the client wants to work on. And we use a device, uh, a psychological device, to modify the message that's sent to the amygdala. We don't put any of our words into it. The client does the whole thing. It modifies the message to be sent from the reptilian complex, the amygdala, the amygdala, which is what generates emotional responses. So although the memory remains the same, it actually feels different. We create, we create a specially receptive artificial weight state where the brain pauses momentarily. And then for just a brief period, the same information is in both reptilian complex and conscious awareness. And this makes it available for change in the way the client wants. So essentially, BWRT allows the client to change how they currently feel to the way they would prefer to feel. So somebody who wants to currently run around shrieking at the side of a spider can choose instead to feel that it's just an ordinary bit of life. They'll still see a spider, but it'll seem completely unremarkable. Just a spider. BWRT at level one is a broad spectrum of therapy. It means you can use it effectively for a vast number of issues, uh, loads of different things. Uh, if you can think of it, you can probably do it. It's a hugely broad spectrum of therapy. But there's also the opportunity to take extra training, optional extra training, if you want to specialize, or even just work in a more targeted fashion for things like depression or relationship issues. And that's all relationships, not just romantic ones. Um, BWRT excels at helping to deal with family problems and work issues too. 
You can even learn how to use it for performance enhancement for athletes, footballers, and gymnasts. In fact, if you can think of a problem where the mind is involved, BWRT can probably fix it. So, if you've never worked from the mind uh, and you want to train, you can train from the very beginning by our newcomers course. It's a year-long course and you have personal tutorials, one-on-one -on -one tutorials um, throughout that course as well. So it's not just looking at a video as some courses are making notes and being left to your own devices. The lessons are live. That's all only, I'm the only one who runs the newcomers course. The lessons are live um, and you get the video afterwards and the notes afterwards. And you do also with a mentor, your supervisor, you do a one-on-one -on -one session every month. So it's a thorough training if you've never trained before. If you're a qualified professional therapist, then you can start at level one. And that's either online with me or in the classroom with one of our trainers. And we've got trainers in the UK, Albania, South Africa, um, New Zealand and Australia at the moment. I don't think I've missed anybody out. You can find out more. Um, those, those two links there, I'm going to put those up in a moment. So you can copy them down. And I'm going to make, put, open the chat box in a moment as well. Um, and you can ask me any questions. But anyway, here's the link.